Good morning. Can people hear me? Uh, I can hear you fine. Thanks for the check. Right. And it is one minute past the hour by my reckoning. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I don't think we had any slides present uh, proposed. Christian, did you get any? Did you see any slides proposed? No. Yeah. So I guess it's just a conversation. So let's hit the agenda and uh, Marco, as always, thank you for taking notes. Uh, so the first thing we have is the DC board discussion. Um, um, Wolf, why don't you give a quick update the on the, the last few changes on DC board and the, the latest um, internet draft. Um, and then let's talk about what where we can go from here. Um, yeah, I'll just give me a moment to come uh, for me to get up on my screen. I'll post the, uh, the link as well. Um, I presume the people who are most interested in this have actually uh, already had a chance to look at it. Um, the main changes were uh, a, uh, you know, because we had uh, a number of people advise us that uh, the API recommendations, you know, weren't as interesting or useful to a lot of people in the IETF uh, that they be uh, moved to, uh, that, that, you know, that, they be de-emphasized. Well, I, I think they're still important, so I moved them to another part of the document. Also, we uh, clarified some things that people had questions on, and uh, I think um, expanded the the um, uh, the section on um, a numerical reduction, which I think is primarily the focus of discussion at the moment. The other thing that I think um, is more or less in the agenda I, I, item is whether the uh, is whether the CBOR working group is going to uh, officially adopt the um, IETF dispatch direct recommendation that uh, um, that we take that it take on the um, DC bore proposal that we've submitted as a draft, uh, and um, uh, and so I mean that's probably the easiest thing to, to determine at this point. Uh, but uh, I think that does need the the group's kind of um, uh, consent to uh, to take that on officially. So. Um, maybe that's the first thing we should talk about. And then assuming that moves forward, then, you know, go on deeper into the, uh, internet draft or the, uh, discussion around, uh, for example, numerical reduction. Just in general, you know, what are the next steps as far as, um, you know, is there interest in, uh, having this document be, uh, from this community and, um, you know, con continue through to some level of RFC. Okay, folks, just, just go ahead and speak up. We have a small group. We don't need our permission. Karsten, go ahead. Right. Yeah, but I'm still going to raise my hand even if you then immediately start blathering. Um, so the, the, um, the document is, is uh, really interesting. Uh, to me, the the problem we will have in in turning it into uh, work for the CBO working group is there are very different things in there, and uh, we probably need to to take some time disentangling them. You already mentioned API uh, discussions. I actually would would, would very much um, appreciate an API discussion. Christopher, your, your system is echoing. Um, I, I very much would appreciate uh, um, an API discussion, but it would lead to a very, very different document, um, for instance, uh, compared to a, a normative uh, document um, about um, a particular encoding profile or whatever we, we uh, uh, start uh, naming uh, that thing. And I also think that, that the tutorial elements of uh, the, the document uh, may be useful, but maybe don't need the, the IETF and its standardization process. Those uh, tutorials really work very well as websites, wikis, whatever. Um, and um, if we want to extract the normative 
uh, component out of that, uh, then we probably should be skipping the tutorial uh, parts. So this is uh, just, um, we can probably prepare this, this carving up uh, today, but uh, obviously the, uh, the, the authors uh, need to do that or need to find uh, people actually who want to cooperate on specific aspects of that. Um, so I heard Anders talking about uh, APIs as well. So maybe Anders is interested in that. I don't know. Um, so um, I, I would like to use this discussion to actually identify those components and sort them into ones that, that uh, in, into possibly multiple ones uh, that we uh, want to discuss here and others that, that uh, are very useful but might better work outside an IDF working group. So, um, is uh, Karsten, do you have interest in helping us um, at least capture the, the part that you think is most standardizable first? Um, you know, the core, uh, you know, uh, stuff about, I'm uh, just, um, I guess we're looking, we're, we can put whatever effort in and make whatever changes are necessary. Uh, to meet the the requirements of the group, um, so. But we also welcome participation and helping us figure out how to do it that you know meets your needs. Yeah, so that, that was a question directly going to me. Um, sure, uh, I, I have uh, somewhat limited uh, time resources. Um, but uh, I certainly uh, am interested in, in helping you doing this this extraction and and uh, uh, possibly formalization in a way that that we could go ahead with a standard strike document. Okay, Carson, uh, a um, I'm quite sure which sections of the current draft you're referring to uh, as uh, tutorial. I would love uh, a little bit more. Um, specific, specificity on that. I also want to make sure the group understands that my motivation for including um, API recommendations in, in it was that I realized that um, um, the goal of determinism is not something that can be um, purely supported by the uh, uh, normative protocol. It's something that if, if determinism is the goal, then it needs to be supported as well by how the um, any reasonable codec is used. Uh, and that this can either be supported or undermined by the API. And therefore, the API itself is, um, um, while um, I've made it clear that these recommendations are not normative in the most recent version of the draft, uh, I feel like there's uh, a lot of value there, and it's important to for people to understand that, um, that determinism is not a purely mechanical process. I mean, do we do we just say that and refer to another document if you want more details? And here is the, but here is the the core, um, uh, some of the core choices. Is that sufficient? I don't. I'm not. That certainly is something that is frequently done. That uh, there'll be a, a standard specification that refers to a wiki page or um, some informational document or whatever for additional information that's not normative. Okay. I think the, the, the kind of the, the larger, more fundamental question that, you know, I'd like to kind of uh, just deal with is, you know, does the does the CWAR working group feel like this is, you know, developing a deterministic CWAR profile, um, possibly using a current draft as a starting point? Um, um, I'm not insisting on that. I just think that, you know, it's a very important goal that definitely um, uh, is uh, is in confluence with the, the needs of our group, um, our nonprofit, uh, developing higher level protocols based on deterministic CWAR. But it's just something that the, that the group officially wants to uh, adopt as an effort. Um, obviously, different people in the group will be making different levels of effort, but I think that's the that's the question to kind of resolve the the re recommendation of IETF dispatch, which we presented um, a month or two ago. Now, yeah. 
So what's the process of accepting something as a work item? Well, that's this is the start of it, having having the discussion with the working group. And then uh, when when the chairs determine that the discussion has gotten to the point where we should ask the working group a final question, should we adopt this document as a working group product, we will post that to the mailing list. So I, I mean, I guess we can take a, a quick poll on this call from where we are so far with this discussion. Does anybody think we should not take this on and uh, use this as a starting point for a working group product? Well, as I said, my problem is that I don't know yet what this will be. Um, I think we should have a discussion on uh, whether the uh, the approach of, of mapping um, integral uh, floating point values onto integers is something that, that really is worth um, having a, a separate role in, in the SIBO ecosystem. But that, that's probably easiest to discuss once we have uh, actually written this up in, in a form where, where we can discuss what, what's actually in there and, and what is not uh, in there. So this would be yeah. section three of, of the current um, uh, document. Um, and uh, section four uh, maybe is a different thing because part of it is, is actually um, protocol, um, how to design a CBO protocol. And part of it is about the actual applications and then we have the the api um, discussion um, so the, these would be separate things for me and uh, i don't see a standard track document coming out of those uh, parts but maybe i'm blind so the, the the next the immediate next step then is for uh christopher and wolf and karsten to get together and figure out how the document needs to be split or reorganized or whatever. Yeah. Um, again, my my motivation was that the, that this is actually rather um, you know critical to like for example the things defined at the application level. Um, you know, if you don't do that right, then you don't get determinism. Um, the could, the issue with numerical reduction. Could, uh, could you could you? Um, yes. Sorry, Wolf. Um, could you try muting and unmuting again? You're Terribly choppy. How's it now? Better. Is it better? Okay. Um, I'm not sure what the re re reason for that would be. Um, no longer better. Yeah, Wolf, you're get you're you're somehow all of a sudden got a lot of noise in your. Let me try switching my um, my audio device for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, one sec. So Karsten, um, Wolf and I are at least planning on doing a day at um, ITF in San Francisco. Are you going to be there? No, I'm not going to be in San Francisco, but uh, of course I will be joining any event you, you want to run there, like a site, site meeting if we manage to, to enable remote participation for that. I've switched uh, microphones okay. and I'm not sure. Um, I know there was time requested. Go ahead, Wolf. choppiness from everybody else. So maybe it's just something systemic in uh, my browser or something like that. I might need to reload the page. Um, is, uh, can you hear me better now? It's a little better, yeah. OK. The main point I wanted to make, and then I'll continue diagnosing the audio issue, is um, that um, the primary issue with numerical reduction is um, uh, more natural support for languages that don't have a a hierarchy of types. And the two languages I'm thinking of primarily are um, JavaScript and Ruby, um, which um, it's much more problematic to work with uh, fixed size numerical types. Um, and uh, uh, that the idea that you should be able to present a particular numerical value to, to uh, a DC more API and know that it's going to be encoded in one specific way. Um, and that that should not be cognitive burden on the engineer. 
to figure out the right way to present that in a, uh, uh, from, for example, JavaScript or Ruby. And it should be, it should be on the, uh, the codex. Um, uh, it should be the codex burden to decide um, how to actually encode that numerical value without loss of precision. So that is the major goal is to basically have, you know, unambiguous ways of encoding things and to uh, secondarily to um, just make it much easier to, for engineers to just present a numerical value and, and know that it's going to be encoded a specific way. Right. So um, uh, Wolf and I and Shannon are planning on um, applying for a side meeting in uh, on the, the higher level protocol, the uh, Gordian protocol at uh, uh, the San Francisco meeting. But I thought I saw a request for time uh, by the Seabor community for um, this upcoming meeting. Uh, is there an agenda for it yet? Or what the, what the hour, what, what we're filling that hour with for the Seabor agenda? And now we'll be working on the agenda on the next call. Um, in two weeks, we'll start working on the agenda. Okay. Anyhow, um, you know, we feel like this would be useful. We have the resources to continue to, to, uh, you know, adapt and make, you know, either split it up or make the changes that you guys recommend, um, uh, in order to, um, you know, mm -hmm. We're seeing that if, as you as we're looking at uh, CBOR's use in other standards groups, whether or not it's W3C or ISO, that having uh, some clear um, uh, conformance uh, for uh, deterministic will make things e easier for a lot of people um, that are using it and in that fashion. Um, we have we have two other topics we wanted to also talk with this community about um, when this one is uh, done. Yeah. Um, before we get there, I'd like to jump in with a question to un to better understand uh, that topic of numerical reduction. So my understanding here is that this is done in order to allow languages with relatively weak typing um, to. Uh, input whatever they have and receive a deterministic uh, document out of it. Um, what I'd like to understand is why is, is float slash integer uh, a sensible distinction here? So for example, if I were to uh, think in terms of Python 2, I might not have a good distinction between a text string and a, and a byte string. And applying, the, applying that rough rationale there uh, would mean that um, the information model is just um, weakened a bit and then all encoders would need to say um, encode byte strings that happen to be UTF-8 in text strings and otherwise as byte strings um, or something like that. Why is integer float a, a good boundary here? Um, and looking at languages that have such an even weaker type model, I've haven't had my hands on PHP in years, but I vaguely remember some weakness between kind of integers and text even. Um, what would be what would need to be done for languages with even weaker typing to still get the deterministic output? And can this not be applied to the languages that uh, don't distinguish integers and floats well? So, um... This would, I think, benefit all languages, um, particularly languages uh, like Ruby and JavaScript that don't have, that just have a number type and that, you know, use whatever internal representation they want, but the uh, engineer generally isn't aware of it. Um, uh, to use existing um, uh, CBOR, you know, you, when you present a number type, it, it has to do something to decide how to encode that number type. Um, and you could have the API insist that you also specify the encoding type. Um, but, uh, you know, given that there's that, you know, you're working with number type primarily in those languages, then, you know, that's becomes an additional burden on the programmer. In languages that have a strong typing system like C or uh, similar languages, um, 
you know, you would present whatever you have. If you have a 32 a, a bit float, you present it as a 32 bit float. Um, internally, the codec would essentially reduce that. If, it's, if it had no fractional part, it would be encoded as uh, um, the, the, uh, an integer without loss of precision um, or accuracy, I should say. And, uh, uh, and in the, you know, the least precise type, it can handle it. So, you know, 3.0 would be encoded as a single byte representing three. Um, and so um, it would actually reduce burden on all languages. Uh, and, uh, and then on the extraction side, you know, when you, um, uh, you know, strongly typed languages with strong numerical types, if you, you know, uh, tell the API that you want to extract uh, a, uh, a, say, a uint 8, and the value in question, say, an element of array, you know, could not be represented in that type, the API would inform you it can't be represented in that type. Um, you know, obviously, um, many people would just, you know, extract a UI, a UN32 or something like that, you know, and then again, if it were, you know, ended up being encoded as a big num by whatever encoded it, um, that would still not be representable at that type, and you'd be informed of that. So um, the idea being that you, you input what you have and you extract what you want, um, and often those will just naturally be the same, um, but, um, and, you know, and, you know, weakly typed language, you know, you input the numbers you have and you extract the number and you extract numbers. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think this is something that um, forcing users of a deterministic CWAR profile to figure out what size to represent in encoding um, is, uh, is going to be very error prone. And I think that this is something that properly needs to be pushed down into the layer of the protocol itself, which is what we're attempting to do with the, with the DC war. I, I, uh, I see profile. what... I, I see what what this is doing, but I don't see why why this is done. For example, for for in, why this makes sense for kind of when going down that road, why stop there? Why keep a distinction between text strings and byte strings? Given there are languages um, like C that use the same um, use the same data type for both. Um, so I don't why, think you're why, going, why, going to be able why, to why, why precisely why precisely here. Yeah, I don't think you're going to be able to in in every case. Um, for example, you know, uh, a, a character pointer in C um, does that represent a byte string, or does that represent a UTF-8 string? And I think, or uh, you know, or just a generic byte string. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at is, you know, does is this properly something that the that the protocol should also carry and in, uh, and determine somehow? And no, the, obviously, C has no affordance for that, um, and so any reasonable C uh, uh, but, you know, DC or API would have to have, you know, you, you would have to present a, a character pointer to it or a UN date pointer and, and you would have to specify at that time, I'm presenting a UTF-8 string or I'm presenting a byte string and it would have to encode it that way. So you can't avoid it in all cases. Many languages do have a much stronger typing system with regard to strings and byte strings, JavaScript and I think Ruby 2 uh, among them where a string is easily determinable to be a string and has uh, an unambiguous encoding and therefore you don't need you wouldn't even need uh, in the API. I'm not I'm not uh, proposing that we specify an API. I'm pr proposing that we specify um, uh, a um, and, and I should say that the, the the issue with numbers is uh, is distinct in some ways from other things that you could say are similar like say byte strings and UTF strings. Um, and, uh, um, but you know, you're not gonna be able to avoid this in all cases. Um, and different languages have different, um, you know, fundamental assumptions they're built on. And so um, when you can distinguish between them, you, you ought to, and when you can't, then yeah, you're gonna have to default to the way that you're forcing people to do network numbers. Numbers are just so common. Uh, and so, uh, and it's so easy to make mistakes when, when it comes to numbers that, uh, and, and they're handled in such a variety of ways. I think it's very important that this distinction be part of a DC board profile. The other thing I just want to throw out here is, you know, where these are being used. Um, uh, you know, there is a lot of JavaScript um, challenges with JWT having to do with, uh, you know, um, uh, various people saying, well, in order to do this type of stuff, we have to include a schema, and then there's a whole complex schema language, and that eventually, you know, is, you know, there's a lot of, of uh, kerfluffle in the W3C uh, verifiable credentials and other groups that are using uh, both JWT and trying to also use uh, um, 
uh, the W3C link data standards because of these types of issues. So we're trying to basically go below it and say, no, that's not the right place to address it. You know, stop, stop bringing in semantic information and, um, and all of that type of stuff and defining your data by, you know, uh, semantic graph, but well, it's not really semantic graphs. It's uh, defining your data through a schema. Um, uh, you know, I'm not, we're not against schemas, but we just feel like it's, uh, causing lots of challenges. Um, we also have, uh, patrons of black of blockchain commons that are working on very constrained devices with very constrained processors. So it's not just, for instance, uh, you know, uh, you know, C versus, uh, rust or something of that nature. It's, you know, a constrained version of C working in a constrained with a constrained version of rust as well is, uh, is another target. Yeah. Maybe I should uh, throw in some, some history. I've tried to do this on the mailing list, but maybe it, it's, uh, better if, if I say this, uh, orally. So, um, when we uh, started to design um, CBOR. Really, the the birth event of of CBOR was when we looked at uh, the the format that we stole everything from, the message pack uh, format, and uh, found that the the distinction between byte strings and text strings was very murky there, and and uh, we really wanted to have uh, a better way. Um, to to separate these out, and uh, so we started discussing with the message back uh, people, and and found that they were not interested in in uh, moving the format forward towards uh, standardization. Uh, so we decided to just go ahead and and uh, throw away the baggage that was on, on message backs back. And uh, this was how how CBO was uh, created. Um, so, uh, looking at issues, um, which distinctions actually make sense in a specific application um, is is very close to the heart and and to the founding myths of of CBO. Um, So, when when we looked at the numerical part, uh, what uh, of course, was uh, our focus was on was constrained devices. Uh, so we already knew that that uh, floating point uh, applications would be um, a subset of the uh, devices that that uh, would use numerical data. So much of uh, what we were going to be using was going to be integer or, or, or implicitly scaled fixed point. Uh, so having a, a good integer system was important, and, and that's uh, what we got. Um, but of course, we had to have floating point support, so we put that in as well. And at the time, we had a um, state of mind that, that also was uh, saying, okay, that, that's just extending the, the number space uh, with additional numbers and, and really the, the integer uh, numbers and the integral floating point numbers uh, should be treated uh, the same. But at the time, we didn't have the the uh, concept written down of what what actually is a generic data model and uh, how how to use this um, in in this uh, uh, specification. Uh, so this is what RFC seventy forty nine did. Um, it, it doesn't, didn't outright say that that integral floating point and, and integers were the same, but it kind of was open to to uh, CBO protocols that, that map them uh, onto each other. And uh, in the seven years between uh, 7049 and, and 8949, uh, we got a lot of feedback that that was not a good decision. So I, I cannot uh, um, replicate every single item of feedback that, that we got here. Uh, but um, I think in, in total, it was pretty clear that uh, people were very unhappy uh, with uh, uh, somehow integers and floating points uh, turning up in, in the same uh, uh, context and that we were better off in, in keeping them uh, separate, at least at the CBOR 
uh, level. So 8949 is, is more on the other end of the pendulum here by, by keeping them separate. But of course, uh, 8949 doesn't uh, prevent an application uh, from uh, doing uh, this uh, mapping. So if your application uh, wants to accept both integers and, and floating point uh, values in a specific numeric position, uh, that's of course fine from the point of view of, of Zebra. Zebra has, has everything it needs to, to support that. So um, what, what was a bit surprising here was the, the uh, desire to uh, move this uh, discussion uh, over from from uh, the the application view, what is an application allowed or supposed uh, to do with numbers uh, towards uh, something that that is deeply in the belly of SIBO, which is the deterministic um, encoding uh, mechanism. Um, I think it, it's very important uh, to keep in mind that having deterministic encoding on the SIBO level doesn't lead to deterministic encoding in general. So the application has to do it, its a piece of work uh, for deterministic coding uh, as well. Um, but um, interspersing a layer between uh, the application and, and uh, CBO, uh, CBO's generic uh, data model that, that uh, changes these numbers for, for the entire uh, use of this profile, that, that's certainly a new idea. And uh, you will find us reacting a bit reserved to this because we, we came from that uh, thinking originally in 2013 and learned that uh, at least in the, the world of constraint devices and in the world of high performance uh, systems, uh, people are not so happy with that, they, they prefer keeping floating point data and integer data uh, separate from each other. Yeah. Karsten, um, so I guess one of my questions, I mean, so one of the things that maybe you know, is a reason why we're bringing this profile forward is that we are representing, we're, so we're a, a not-for-profit commons organization consisting of a, a large number of software developers but what they all have in common is that they're they're signing data uh, in one form or another. Whether or not it's sensor data coming off a wellness ring, um, you know, or uh, uh, a uh, uh, you know a photograph, or you know, various kinds of of, of statements that are being made, and uh, uh, the the. That's the application, and because of the signing requirement and making that consistent uh, across many different uh, classes of devices uh, and CPU engines and you know, even worse, secure element engines uh, with very constrained things is, is what's driving, drove us to Seaboard. Um, that being said, a lot of the code that's out there, I mean, I'm still shocked there's this thing called MicroPython that lots and lots of people are using now on uh, on these chips. Um, and so, you know, at some point we're gonna have to, you know, make a version of this in MicroPython. <laughs> um, but we, they all have to interoperate. Right. So what, what I'm trying to find out is uh, why the, the signal we got from implementers uh, about separating integers and floats was, was uh, uh, so strong and, and how, how your community arrives at, at a different uh, signal. So that there may be several reasons for that. One is that your community is just different from the one where we got the initial feedback for SIBO. Another one, uh, another reason might be that the, the environment has just changed. And um, I, I already said that uh, we are going to have a lot of interesting number of presentations coming up um, in, in the near future. Uh, we, we already have uh, several uh, CPU and GPU and NPU and whatever uh, chips that have interesting number of presentations. Um, so we, we probably will have to look at this in, in a more general sense later on. Um, 
people who have lots of numeric data often organize these in arrays. And that's why we have tagged arrays in, in uh, uh, CBO. And it's probably also necessary to think about uh, signing information that is in these tagged arrays. So we, whatever we do here, uh, probably also needs some thinking about uh, tagged arrays and, and the current types that are uh, in there, the current number types right. uh, that are in so, there and the future ones coming up. So speaking specifically to that was sort of my other agenda item. So we had two pieces of feedback based on, you know, presenting um, uh, Gordian envelope at dispatch. Um, the first was, uh, you know, they didn't quite understand the, um, you know, who our, quote, our customers were. Um, and we basically had two responses to that. Uh, one important response was, we feel like, you know, anybody who stores data at rest in ITF standards should be subject to the, the two RFCs that uh, the ITF have published on privacy and um, uh, that's uh, 6973, privacy considerations for internet protocols and also 8280, research into human rights protocol considerations. Those are supposed to be what we are now mandating, yet there are basically no standards that are really uh, taking advantage uh, of using those as a basis for requirements um, uh, at the data at rest level. So, you know, you were just talking about, uh, you know, data formats, the data format that people are using for a lot of this type of stuff is a graph store, which is a little bit more complex than, uh, than lists. So we basically created what we thought was a very elegant triple store that could store not just the linked data graphs that is very popular in the W3C side of the world, but could also uh, support other graph um, triple forms and and such, and allow for those triples to be also elidable while while being signed. So it addresses those uh, uh, those ITF. Uh, RFCs requiring options for data minimization. And we have lots of, I have a whole lot of use cases on our website about, you know, how this can be used by the wellness industry, by the education industry, by other industries. Um, so we're kind of confused on, you know, how to try to move this forward because one part of it is this, you know, requirements uh, of, you know, for securing data at rest of uh, things like what DC, uh, what Seabor uses. And then there is the, uh, you know, this additional kind of layer that's separate from any kind of elision capability, which is how do you do various forms of graph data in Seabor? And we've addressed both of those in, um, in Gordian Envelope, have working code, and people are beginning to actually, um, you know, we're looking at a, um, a wellness ring, uh, you know, that it, that also does cryptographic signing, uh, you know, using this technology, you know, this year. So, um, and they're in, <laughs> so, and they're not the only ones, but that's probably the most constrained one. So we'd like to try to, you know, see if there's interest in the, in uh, the ITF and, you know, uh, standardizing the six tags that we have for a uh uh well excuse me it's seven tags but we're reusing one uh one existing tag uh to allow for some fairly sophisticated uh triple stores um and options for triple stores and gives you this additional capability if you wish to to elide uh, uh data for data minimization requirements without doing fancy bbs cryptography and things of that nature, um, which is okay, uh, but we're not, we're, we're trying to, it, I can have a whole discussion about when you should use CL SIGs versus EC SIGs versus uh, BBS plus proofs or things of that nature. <clears throat> but uh, the simple hash-based elision, uh, you know, we think uh, is powerful uh, to address uh, these structured data requirements so is i just i'm wondering is there interest in this community and uh you know defining uh 
you know, those seven tags and how they are put together to make for fairly powerful um, uh, structures. So maybe it's worth pointing out that there is an um, ITF working group that, that is doing something very, very similar, uh, which is uh, the SCIT uh, working group, which is looking at supply chain transparency, which has uh, a lot of, of uh, rather similar requirements. Uh, so they are also looking at, at uh, Merkle trees and, and how to have transparency registries um, that, that uh, can provide both transparency and, and privacy and so on. Uh, so I, I think you should really try to involve those people um, and, and maybe first have some offline discussions uh, with the main drivers uh, there and, and then later on decide um, whether maybe your uh, envelope format is, is a useful formative contribution for what, what Skid is trying to um, achieve. Um, so no. des de describing this as a set of uh, seven tags is, is certainly one way of looking at it, but really it, it's a um, uh, pretty powerful data structure that, that will be used in a lot of uh, areas. And so it, it, I think it would be good if we have a common uh, view in the IETF of how this is done. All right. So the suggestion it was that that uh, and we actually have a uh, you know kind of an early draft of something which is um, uh, a problem statement and area of work. Um, uh, where did there there it is? Uh, so that is a uh, an early draft of a you know problem statement of hey you know this is the requirements of those two RFCs. One of the key areas that to be able to support those requirements is data minimization, and then you know uh, go go down down that route. Uh, you know, I I do monitor the the SCITT uh, list. Um, they are an application. Um, uh, they have a you know very specific purpose, um, and then they're basically kind of. I, I, you know, they are aware of Gordian, but they're also flailing a little bit because it is an application group for a very specific application, which is supply chain. Whereas ours is much more generic and uses, uh, I mean, it's a lot closer to Seabor. I mean, one of my fears is this gets kind of dragged into security. Um, whereas I really feel like this, other than the fact that it has a hash tree in it, I really feel like it's an art function. It's an it's an application function. You know, it's a it's a tool for. Um, I mean, we actually have a demo of um, uh, in our use cases of uh, the Mastodon protocol uses uh, an IETF standard uh, that that once again puts data at rest at these different servers. Uh, how can we leverage? Um, data minimization to protect privacy on Mastodon servers. Well, if they just stored their data at rest in, in a Gordian format, it would address a lot of their problems. And they're not part of Skit, will never be part of Skit. So I don't know. I don't know what the, the right answer. I just feel like there is a, you know, Seabor is a support, a very elegant spot in a support layer that um, is relatively straightforward, doesn't require you to go to semantic layers with schema data and whatever in order to do all of the different types of operations that you want to do. It has the primitives that you need. Um, right now, there are no formal RFC primitives for one of the most common types, which is graph data. Um, and ours, we believe ours can do all three major forms of graph data uh, as well as some lists and other different types of things that are interesting. Um, and that's just a fundamental basic addition uh, to, to Seabor. And thus, we'd, I mean, we'd like to see that possibly not as a whole, have to form a whole not new group, um, uh, working group to, to, to do Gordian, but at least get the graph part of it into uh, the, the, the Seabor group. 
may also may also add something else here, which is, um, you know, obviously I'm I'm working engineer. Uh, I'm uh, not a cryptographic expert, but I've been working with various kinds of cryptography that uh, that uh, you know, and and I'm I'm very practically minded when it comes to um, you know uh, the APIs I work with and and develop. And uh, I've been designing this Gordian uh, and implementing this Gordian envelope uh, protocol on top of Seabor, and a lot of my impetus for the DC Bor uh, Internet Draft. Um, has arisen out of my actually, first of all, um, implementing um, uh, Envelope without it, uh, just based, just using a third party Seabor codec, open source Seabor codec, um, and then realizing that due to these uh, issues that keep coming up with numbers and so on, and now having implemented it in, in, uh, in two, um, well, I've fully implemented it in Swift, which has a strong, strong number, number type system, and I'm currently implementing it in Rust. And I'm anticipating doing a JavaScript TypeScript uh, um, implementation as well. That we basically uh, and Kotlin, yeah. Um, uh, and, and some of these we may be working with third parties on, but a lot of this stuff is, you know, I'm, it's a solo effort, but supported by Blockchain Commons. Um, that uh, it's all open source. That um, these number, these issues, particularly with numbers, keep coming up. And anticipating also working with more weekly type number systems, it realized, I realized that um, that a lot of the things I was having to deal with at the envelope level were more properly pushed down to the Seabor level, um, and uh, and handled in a very kind of uniform way. Um, and well, that was my I, I, impetus for creating this the the DC bore uh, spec, and that's why it also handles things that I had to deal with, including both things that would be considered normative for C bore encoding itself, but also um, things like uh, you know API recommendations, which I I just you know I have empirically found to make my higher level code much more straightforward, and and also the APIs people have to to. Um, work with to to use the Gordian envelope uh, protocol itself. So, what would happen if we move the numeric reduction into the Gordian envelope protocol? Not not necessarily. I mean, I see the the there's a value out um, for it in and of itself. Uh, you know, I mean. There is a scenario in the future where we, you know, work together to create a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, in W3C, what we would call a note that basically says, hey, if you're implementing CBOR and you have these specific types of requirements, here's a profile of, you know, what is required to be deterministic. And these are the kinds of things you have to be careful of. And here's some choices that were made as uh, you can do whatever you want, but here's some choices that were made that were you know carefully thought about if you're really looking for consistency here. Um, maybe another note on uh, if you if you feel like it needs to be separate on you know sort of the application side of that and how how are those decisions made, et cetera. And then there's another document that says, hey, you know, here is a small set of tags that you can use in some very elegant uh, ways to create fairly complex structures of a new, you know, not just lists, not just uh, uh, tables, but, uh, you know, various kinds of graph structures uh, with Seabor. And if you're doing graph structures, you know, you can do everything you need with these seven tags in this way. And then there would be something else to say, oh, well, as long as you're doing that, you know, hey, here's some ways you can do some simple data minimization to protect people. Maybe I don't know if those are all separate documents to, or if they're to all tied your, together. Yeah. They're not even, not all of them even have to be done by the Seaboard group. But I could see a future where all four of those are are published. Karsten, to to address your question specifically, you know, at, at now having pushed these um, these issues down into our own DC Seaboard libraries, which are, exist both in Swift and Rust, uh, and and are being looked at by other people or and ourselves for conversion in other languages still. Um, I would never pull it back up into Gordian Envelope. It's too um, generically useful and basically streamlines all the rest of the higher level code built on it. Um, and so our goal with the internet draft is to propose to the IETF that it's not just useful for us, it's useful for everybody. Yeah. Um, and that therefore it be uh, yeah. uh, ultimately adopted as some form of RFC. If, if that I weren't possible, we would still publish it as our own profile and continue using it, um, you know, because it's just, it, it makes things much easier at the higher levels. There, there, when I'm, determinism I'm, is a requirement. 
I'm, I'm pretty sure there are cases where it's where this is yes. useful, especially when working with with languages such as JavaScript. Um, but it may help to I mean, kind of move, moving. So in, I, I'm, I'm not sure it makes so much sense in the encoder. It may not make sense in Gordian either. Um, looking back at the at the at the discussion um, on on the first part of first part of this, and um, before we switch to the triple topic. Um, Maybe this is not so much about an encoding, but it's more a new information, uh, a new variant of the information model. So you're um, you're taking the generic, um, uh, the, gen uh, the general Seaboard information model, placing a new information model on top of it, in which all numeric types are equivalent, which then has precise rules for encoding into Seaboard, and then these, uh, and then that Seaboard can be encoded deterministically. And applications such as Gordian may choose to use that information model. Um, maybe maybe splitting it along those lines helps helps keeping these keeping these a part of it, because we're having a, there's a there's a lot of material in here, and I'm, we're jumping back and we're jumping back and forth between layers, and I think this is hard to keep track of. Christian, are you going to be in San Francisco? Um, only, only remotely. Only remotely, okay. I will be in Prague, but that's um, half a year from now. Yeah, me too. Well, it sounds like uh, uh, I'm not sure both of us can be be uh, there uh, in person, um, but certainly remotely we can. We're, we're dealing with a third of the world away, uh, but we'll figure it out. Um, you know, we'll, um, we think this is important work. Um, you know, I agree that it is kind of a weird, we're not doing a great job uh, describing our layers, but boy, it's even worse at the level above us. Um, so, you know, in JSON LD, uh, which is, you know, what W3C has been moving forward for a while, um, it is so tangled. It's like, uh, well, you, you know, you have to understand the semantic la layer and you have to be able to parse this context. And this part, this context has all kinds of, of, um, you know, extra details about what it means and how it this meaning is different than this other meaning. Oh, and by the way, we're using that to sort your arrays so that they can be deterministic. And it's like, I, you know, everybody's pulling their hair out at all of the complexity of layers um, uh, and, and their interactions in that area. And they haven't even really gotten to standardizing uh, some, some uh, min, you know, data minimization at rest type issues. Um, and they're you know kind of fighting with the JWT group uh, about various uh, you know data profiles there. And for, whenever I look at it, I go, it's just there's just like you know, I'm not counting, but you know five or six layer violations that are happening uh, over there that are causing problems. So I'm very sympathetic yeah. on this side to say, yeah, maybe this needs to be divided up into a little bit more layers to be clear what you know, you know. Here is Seabor, and then here is a DC bore thing on top of it, and then here is a Gordian uh, graph structure on top of it, and have those be very nice and clean. Uh, I'm very sympathetic uh, to that. I, I just, you know, I, I, would, I guess the key question is, you know, are there sufficient other people in the Seabor community that are interested in these types of things that? Um, it's worth driving forward, you know, uh, multiple interrupt. I mean, we, we are providing one of the, uh, you know, well, more than one uh, uh, implementation with, you know, Rust and Swift. Um, we have partners that are working on it in Python and well, other languages. If, if I may interrupt, at, at least, for, at least for, for many distinct parts of this, you will find people here that, um, that will, that will contrib contribute. Um, that's one thing in, in, in the interest of, of keeping this um, easy to understand and, and keeping the layers low, there's one thing that I'd like to understand, and maybe I just missed it when, when looking through the DC board parts. Um, in many other places uh, where we were about signing uh, seaboard data, what worked well was to just um, 
pass data around as they were encoded byte strings and work from those and just never re-encode. Did did you was this evaluated around the seaboard? Because all those numeric um, all those numeric flexibilities would basically fall out if this were an option. Once a Wolf, uh, go ahead. When, at the guardian envelope level, once you've encoded something um, as an envelope, uh, you know, since it's a, a hash tree. Um, a number of the types are based, you know, the actual hashes are based on the encoded CBOR. So in that respect, you can't change the coded CBOR afterwards. The, the question is, for example, if I encode, uh, if, if I want to encode the value 10 and you want to code the value 10 separately, are we converging on an equivalent or an identical um, hash? And, um, and if, we, if separate encoders can't necessarily coordinate across time and space, right. To uh, unless they have a standard to focus on, and what you're suggesting is that well, we have, you know, uh, uh, that I encode ten, uh, and then you never re-encode it. Well, the question is, why not just have the same way of encoding ten? Uh, yeah, the thing is, we 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 are already passing around a signature, and at some point we're passing around uh, the data that is being signed. So right. can so, the date can because otherwise so I, I can't can verify this that a little. Yeah, I can answer this a little bit differently. Um, so this is b basically an architectural choice that JWT made and others have borrowed since, um, which is you basically have the original plain text, um, you know, in whatever form it is. Uh, and because it's being carried around, because, you know, they're not canonicalizing the JSON, they're basically, keep, you know, taking whatever the JSON is, passing that's, that's it. Hold, hold on, let me let me finish the uh, that style of thing um, ha, is biting people all over the place. So first off, uh, when you start doing multi multi signature stuff, it ends up massively multiplying the the uh, the size of the of the structures in a, in a number of these. A lot of these structures now, it's not just one signature; it's many signatures. Um, uh, you know, o over time. Also, people are trying to, you know, basically, uh, no, I don't want it in a CBOR format. You know, I need it in my graph database, uh, which can handle these types of things. Yet, I need to be able to check and see, is this still valid when I export out of my uh, graph database? So, what ends up happening with JWT situations often is that they actually have to pull in the the data into the database, and then a big blob of the JWT data along with it, because they, you know, they have no guarantee that the they can reconstruct and and compare the hashes. Uh, so they just take the original object, which then causes problems when things become updated, because if the thing something you exported out of the blob gets uh, changed, you also have to to invalidate the blob and. Just there have been a lot of headaches with that sort of style of construction. Um, yeah, I think the the, the consensus uh, that that we have reached uh, by now is uh, that um, if you can get away with it, sign data in flight. So this is what what Cozy does. Um, there are applications that require signing data at rest. That's what and, we care about. Uh, the, the mistake that XML DSIG made was uh, to say, oh, that's the only kind of data we will support. So they pulled in all the complexity of signing data at rest uh, into the places where signing data in flight would have been uh, completely appropriate. Uh, so we, we will, from, from the people who have worked with COSI, um, you will always get a pushback asking, do you really have to sign data at rest or can you get by data in flight because we have a much easier way to solve that problem? Um, so you will always get that yeah. pushback, but I We've think there's that. also an understanding at this point in time that, that there are applications that need to do that. Yeah, well, yes. a lot of our uh, people are we, doing we, we credentials. We publish many examples stuff. of Gordian Envelope. That... So I, have, I have to interrupt here. Uh, we yeah, are out of we've, time. It's okay. Yep. I think there's some lag. Um, yeah, we, we've we are out we've published of time. a number of examples oh. of Gordian envelope where Hello? the data at rest is absolutely signed.
I've shut you off. We are out of time. Um, so let's take this discussion, the rest of this discussion to the mailing list. And um, we know the steps forward now, right? Uh, the next the next step is to, uh, the next step for the other discussion is for Karsten to get together with the DC board people and sort out the document. And we can continue the rest of this discussion on the mailing list. Okay. So thank you. Thank you everybody for coming today. And uh, if we need to put this back on the agenda for two weeks from now, we can do that. I would prefer that we try to continue the discussion on the mailing list instead and, um, and then see where that goes. Okay. A primary discussion for two weeks from now will be uh, starting to put together an agenda for the uh, IDTF session in July. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.